thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's a real pleasure to be here. I love reciting poetry. I love poetry. I love writing poetry. And uh, it's always a joy to share it. I think in the context of what's happening now, um, the fact that we are emerging from the C-19 pandemic, uh, still very much in it in a different way, I would assume and suppose. Uh, for me, this question of belonging um, is becoming ever more pertinent. And it's really a pleasure to be able to share some of my thoughts and my experiences that are expressed in poetic form uh, with you this evening. So thank you. My work as an artist, I'm a fine artist, I'm a social sculpture practitioner, and I'm also an energy healer. And all of them combine for me in what you see in front of you. Um, but much of it informs the poetry that I write. This collection of poems, entitled Evoking Belonging, was written over the last seven years as I have been exploring the sensorial experience of what it means to belong. I've been doing this as part of uh, doctoral studies and research in social sculpture, but what you read here is informed by my entire life journey. What you read here is also informed by what I intuit as those that come before me. And in beginning, this sharing with you, I'd like to invite our ancestors into the room. Part of what we do with evoking belonging, evoking belonging is a practice, it's a social sculpture practice. We look at and we engage issues of racial, cultural and healing justice. It is offered as a practice uh, currently online, uh, generally, generally face to face, and it has a number of touch points. But in this expression here, what I've done is I have created three parts to this book, which speak of homage as part one, homage to our ancestry. I believe we cannot begin to think about what it means to belong without thinking about where we've come from. It's my custom and tradition to call the ancestors into the room when we begin any form of sharing especially something as deep and as potent as this offering, I hope will be. It has been inspired by my ancestral path. I'm very honored to have my mother in the room. Thank you, mom, for joining. And with that, I'd like to invite us all to just pause for a moment and think about our lineage of mothers. sense into their being, whether they're still with us on this plane or in other realms, to really call our mothers into being and, if we can, their mothers and maybe another generation back. And I'll invite you to silently call the lineage forward into this space with us today. Equally so on the paternal side. My father's not with us here in this room on the Zoom, but I know he's in the house there with mom. <laughs> so he's not far away. I'd invite you all to consider your father and his father and see whether you are able to sense into the lineage that comes. And as we call the ancestors into the room, I will offer this poem. This is a poem that I wrote in response to what really spurs what for me is a lifelong practice, a lifelong journey and a lifelong conviction around the evocation of belonging. When people ask me where I am from, which, which happens wherever I roam, 
you know, in the world. Often, for many years, it was a question that evoked very difficult emotions for me. And it did that because I don't have one place where I was born, where my parents were also born, and we have a history of being in one place. My parents are of the Windrush generation in this country. And our particular story is that we grew up, my parents, when I was under one year old, grew up in Zambia. And I've spent half of my life in the African continent and half of my life back and forth between various parts of the UK. Apart from that, I have a lineage that goes much further back. And what I find in my work in activism as an artivist is that those who, like me, are historically displaced are very less visible. That expression of our being is often forgotten, is easily misunderstood. We think about refugees, we think of migrants, and we think of the current waves of migration. However, the journey that my parents took, the journey that my ancestors took in the Atlantic slave trade, still sits within my genealogy today. And so as we are all in this unfolding expression of what it is to belong in an unfolding world order, new world order, I would say, questions of the origin story emerge. When somebody says, where are you from? To get around this question and the difficult conflicting feelings it would evoke within me, I created this poem. I say I am of Caribbean parentage, of African heritage, and the skin that I am gifted in is offered to you as the urban indigen. And this book is called The Poetics of the Urban Indigen. For in poesis, when I sit and I dwell within all these complexities of what I've just expressed to you really means, the skin I am gifted in. We live in a world where the narratives, the mainstream narratives that we hear do not really present a positive picture of the skin that I believe is a gift to the world. Hence I say, the skin that I am gifted in is offered to you as the urban indigen. Questions of indigeneity, who belongs here? What heritage do we carry? These are some of the themes that you'll see through this book. This be an offering for we, the living beings, the scattered seeds, now free yet ever yearning, ever cultivating spaces, ever evoking belonging. So I'll start off with the first section of the book, which is called homage. This is offering, offerings to our ancestral past. And this poem is called Bami Bahia Nights. Tightrope. Misses step. Tight rope, misses step. Tight rope. Fierce, she calls romantic. Stripping chained interludes. Ocean deity protective. Guarding fiercely our heritage. Me say tight rope, I'm just coming and me step. Tight rope, me say step. Stepping romantic footsteps, ballistic steps, evoking belonging. Renegade indigen, triptych passage fragmenting. Blown by trade wings, source fabric, drawstring, cocooning culture, the 
wellspring. Resistance, guarded birthrights, we honor ancestral beings. This be a provocation to, to step, step on the tight rope for the Orisha deities, don't forsake we. Trip light, fantastic, Yemanja calls fragility. It is a hot foot to the tight rope. Journey on hope, romantic. Fragments of knowing, I, yes, I walk steady, faith on the tight rope, acculturated intent, restive natures, they step for the stronghold snares, resistance. Spirit call holds we yemanja, hmm. resistance, guarded birth right. Honor ancestral beings, guard fiercely her offering. Guided hot stepper, bequest Orisha, step on the tight rope in gratitude. I step on the tight, 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 the tight rope. Fade to black. Thank you. Second poem in the Hamas section is entitled Sweet Mama. There is a classic song that is played at house parties, at gatherings, which is called Sweet Mama. And it's a classic tune that gets everyone on the dance floor. Here, I was feeling this as I walked on the sands, the black sands that you will see pictured in the book of Bayabu in St. Vincent from where my father hails. And I was there a year before we published this book. We went to bury my aunt and every morning my aunt, another aunt and I would walk on these sands. And I was deeply conscious of the footsteps. We would be barefoot and we'd walk up and down and literally the house is just behind. And I'd hear stories of how my father and all the siblings would come out. Granddad would take everybody out to go and bathe, take a sea bath every day. The footstep as a site of memory for me is something that is very prominent in my world. And it is through memory that I believe we are able to really create a foundation of resistance. Sweet mama. Oh, sweet mama, I will not forget you. Hmm. We bow in homage to our ancestors, those displaced, forcibly removed, those who rest at sea. We bow in homage to our ancestors, those who survived tempestuous voyage, the middle passage over ocean seas. It is we, beloveds, we who step barefooted, vulnerable, open to possibilities. We intentioned so clear Yes, so free. We, the freedom being, called to seize the moment, called to anchor, craft, and shape testimony. We, the freedom being, return, reclaim, regenerate. Nurture new narratives of free. Oh, sweet mama, I will not forget you. Mm -mm. Me, I lovingly proclaim the freedom being I be. Ubuntu, without you, I do not exist. 
Thank you. That is sweet mama. So the next poem in the homage section is a short offering to that Atlantic journey. It's called Tidal Waves. Crossing lines, waves, triangular ancestry, traces bridges to deep, censored ecology. Threading mournful soliloquy, Ubuntu pearls cosset a collective memory, a history of othering, negation of being souls adrift, no anchoring. Tidal waves under crescent moon. Thank you. The next section is, thank you, <laughs> thank you. The next section is home. And in my work, I'll always look at these three spaces for me, uh, spaces on, for exploration and discovery. The now presencing moment, and that is what this section of the book is devoted to. Home, truth, and hearts. Okay. We will speak to truth now. I'm just going to actually... Yeah. Truth. Light shard strobe morning sky shears nomad nomad trauma. Sunlight solves passages, fragments falling in morning. Dewdrops witness audacity. Born testimony over midnight crossing. Morning sky reverie anchors truth soliloquy acts, dreamt on cirrus cutlass histor rhetoric, seizing contra time, percussive buoyant ocean sentinel, sacred secret salted grief embalming, redundant narratives. For you, cicatrist soul generative, chasms, space. Light. For you, cicatrice degenerative, tie soul to kinship symbols branded. Tie soul to choice encounter. Tie soul to space, flight, ignition, engendering truth, earth sprung. Crafting voiced soliloquy, patina bonding tongues. They chorus, oh yes, hmm. they chorus native songs. Noon rays atop, heady heat propels, rayoned alchemy, speak truth to power. I say speak truth to power. Speak truth to power. Chorus those native songs. Dusk falls disrupted, ocean waves buoyant, syncopation accent, new day rhythm. Dance, hot stepper, dance for they be haunted heart, warriors speaking truth to power, I say. Chorus, native songs, a soul etched patina, emblems alchemic, the anchor, Prima materia. Take stance, haunted hearts, 
for belonging is yours for the taking. Thank you. The next poem is a short little ditty. It's called The Heart Song Sky. My spirit sings, my soul takes flight. Let's dance in rainbows as we touch the sky. You ululating. <laughs> Elevating celestial pyres. Altars to our divinity, these are prayers for our dance. My heart song with you. Mm. Enchanted, entranced. Thank you. To close this section, I will then speak once more to truth and this poem is called The Truth Bearers. They stand as witness, shadowing all those who trip, doubting as passers-by. To all those who stand head swaying in disbelief, seeking, searching for nooks, dark, unwholesome to unfold, they they bear witness, for this experience is a head-spinning alchemy of hearts, of soul, of destiny, an incoherent truth to those seeking with brain logic, avoiding heart map, for this constellation could never be understood on a mortal plane. So as we dance so close to the sun, passerby can only glance upwards. Momentarily I shy, for their denial fries, sight organs whiplashed in mundane reality. The truth bearers stand as witness. This call is a release, relief from the constant poke, faithless, cracked backbone, vertebra in vertigo as crushing, spellbound doubters, they fall. Now, reeling in timely syncopation, reveal truth evoked in earth rhythms, ignited indigo moon song. Hmm. This be no sad lament. Revel in the fire dance, defy the drowning, thrust through waves and oceans of doubt and fear. Reconnect to the knowing. Source fabric swathing, smarting wounds of shattered dreams. These shards they be, earth splintering. The truth bearers stand as witness. There is an intruder in our midst. The truth bearers are called to bear witness, stand firm yet fluid and connected. For great moments like these revered on 2020 vision planes, we shall reminisce, we shall see. Story etched, smudged amber glow, for on this earth walk we, fallible in mortal flow, these times throng destiny disconnects. In that great, knowing the truth bearers, they bear witness. Thank you. Kate, I'm conscious of the time. I think I'll read one little one from the last section and then thank you all, thank you. I'll read one more from the last section and then we can open up for some questions, okay. I'm going to read The Calabash in the Round, one of my favorite poems. This was written as I thought of a really significant journey that I made to Mali in West Africa. 
and I was in the Dogon lands, an ancient African civilization. And it was market day and I came wholly unprepared, wrong footwear to be climbing <laughs> to the escarpment. <laughs> this was like a hiking trip and I saw these beautiful women walking up this incredibly steep mountain that I needed two people to help me get down <laughs> with calabash of milk on their head and they swayed with such dignity and grace and they stopped and they looked at me and the comments that were coming were like, whoo, is she going to make it? <laughs> it was an unforgettable trip, but here in honor of those beautiful memories is the calabash in the round. Shaped, sculpted, she came to me, undulating, her gait softly yielding. She came in slow step flow, balancing her fecundity, high head top high, licensed, expressive dignity. Her indigo blue wrapper lifts, lifts lightly as one foot ahead, her beaded fecundity sways, yes, hips swinging, holding, dignity embroidered chastity, she comes towards me, holding possibility, a top head wrap high, an offering to Father Sky, she hails from First Peoples, Indigen indelibly inked into her psyche. As she walks in slow step flow, she rises through anchored humility. An offering she carries so delicately, a top head high, no mountain too steep no rocky slides. She comes with calabash in the round, held en route to markets. Precious cargo laps softly on edge. Each step awakens continuity. Knowledge so deeply etched, she holds calabash in the round. Dignity, sweet fecundity. Hmm. The calabash in around. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. That was, that was incredible. Um, Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. We appreciate the reading of it. Um, and we're still, we're still absorbing it. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's been wonderful because I've, I've been reading it the last month as well. Um, and for you to just read it out um, is it, something else. Um, okay, I'm going to open up for questions. I've got lots of questions myself. I've been jotting away as I've been reading this and thinking about this because it's brought up so many ideas, the book. Um, but I, I, I am going to open it out to anyone else. So does anyone else want to ask a question? Diane. Almost, it's almost difficult to follow that actually. Uh, we've got lots of comments coming in saying what joy and what, how much people are, are enjoying your reading. Of them. Uh, thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, can I ask a question there? I've got lots. Um, and, and we can always have some more poems as well if it's a bit of time, but you know, we don't need to um, go over time. Um, oh gosh. Okay, so one of my questions was um, your poetry um, and your art is, um, uses imagery of, of your body and the water and nature, you've got the oceans. You've got sand um, and lots of fecund food. Um, you, you seem really deeply connected to nature and the landscape in your poems. That comes through really strongly. Um, so my question is, do you feel that many people, particularly in the West maybe, have lost their connection with the land 
and with nature? I would say, firstly, thank you for the question and the observations. Indeed, uh, mine is an urban experience and um, I think it's evident for us all to see that the disconnection to nature um, in the majority is all pervasive. I'm very clear that um, wherever I roam, I am attracted to green spaces and we're aware that there are studies that have been published um, that tell us that the disconnection between nature and the concrete spaces within which we live, you know, is really causing some serious mental health issues, um, especially in young people uh, today. I am very inspired by nature and it's part of my spiritual heritage to be deeply connected to nature. Um, you will often hear whispers in the winds. You know, as I write, it's, it's very much a channeling process and um, often the words are flowing before I can even really make sense of them or even decipher them when they come out if I'm writing, you know, manuscripts. Um, but part of this work also is to evoke that memory of nature. Connection to the land for African diaspora communities, as you can imagine, is a very heated subject. It's a heated subject because really, if we're talking about connection to land, when people ask me, where am I from? Often they want a geographical location. And when we think about where you're from, for somebody like myself, who's had the, the life experiences that I have had, that becomes a very difficult question. So I very intentionally work with land wherever I roam as what I call an urban nomad to establish a sense of connection, to really seed my being in that space. And you know, as we speak about footsteps being a site of memory, um, there've been times when, um, especially in that trip that I spoke about when we went home to bury one of our family matriarchs, that the footstep, and you'll see pictures of feet in, in, in the book, you know, um, here, there will be, there's a body of work actually that I'm creating that is linked to footsteps as site of memory. And I think it's an interesting um, possibility to present and reawaken the connection to land. I think for us as African people, we have never been, um, confused about that <laughs> but I can definitely see in generations following me that that disconnection is more and more evident so a part of my work absolutely is about recreating that connection. Thank you that's answered it so beautifully and um, you know all those thoughts were going through me about this absolute spiritual connection with the landscape and it's so universal to have that connection with moon with tides with with sand with water with land it's absolutely fundamental so thank you okay we've got um another question here from john do you want to to say your question to ask your question john Yeah, thank you. I was wondering what Ubuntu means. Aha, so thank you for your question. Ubuntu is a Bantu African philosophy, cultural practice. So when I say Bantu, you will find Bantu people in the south, in center, and somehow to the east of Africa. And when we say Ubuntu, it means in essence humanity. Ubuntu is something that I work with in this work, in this body of work um, throughout my research. And I translate it to mean without you, I do not exist. And I feel that when we are able to really sit and contemplate the magnitude of that sense of connectedness, 
and how disconnected we are, especially on these sides of the world, to that deep knowing. For me, it's something that I believe exists. If we say it means humanity, I truly believe that no matter your ethnic origin as human beings, we have that deep sense of connection. But again, I think it's something that has been fragmented and it's certainly in terms of cultural practices, something that seems to have been forgotten. So when I share um, my work or when I create spaces to engage with communities or with heads and captains and captainesses, I don't know what you'd call them of industry. <laughs> For me, simple things like greetings are an expression of Ubuntu. I said to Kate earlier, I would really like to take the time. For me, it's never too much time to get to know who is in the room, to enable that honoring of every human being, all these faces that I'm seeing. For me, it's part of my practice, and it's something that I am very intentionally um, evoking in my work. And when we speak about evoking belonging, these are some of the underlying uh, tenets of the work. There's another aspect to Ubuntu, which is about co-creation. And I feel that what is really possible when we're able to recognize, revive that spirit of Ubuntu within us, is that we then have the potential for co-creation. Yes, together. I think it's um, a step that there are a couple of steps that need to happen to enable that to happen in any kind of transformative way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, there's um, two two more questions coming up um, at the moment. We've got um, Kevin and then Halima after that. So Kevin, would you like to ask your question? All right, yeah. Uh, sure, uh, uh, I, I, uh, thanks for a really spellbinding reading. It was wonderful. Um, I, I, so I think in your introduction, you referred to yourself as an artivist, Indeed. if I heard correctly, which I was intrigued by, which I guess is a combination of activist and artivist, uh, activist and artist. So I wondered if you could say a bit more about that. Maybe yes. how to interact. Indeed, indeed. Um, the idea for me is that um, as an artist who is concerned with issues of justice, we bring the two together and we speak about artivists. So um, I have created the Evoke community, which is a private online space of artivists of the African diaspora working with culture to look and see how we can translate artistic practice into this justice space. One thing I'm very clear about, I'm often called to read poems, um, and I, you know, I know a lot of musicians, et cetera, who'll be called to warm up the space. Now, we know the power of artistic expression, be it in painting, be it in poetry recitals, et cetera. You know, it works on so many levels, it evokes spirits, uh, ancestors, uh, emotions, it takes us into another realm, another way of seeing and feeling and being in the world. And for me, that is a very potent thing. So part of my activism is about, and you know, and choosing to call myself an artivist, is because I want to be at that table, not as a strategist, as an artivist. Yes? And so part of the work for me is about creating pathways for artists who are engaging in, yes, social change practice, um, but really looking at justice issues to come to the table and be recognized, want to be able to present their practice as um, a change-making transformative process, whatever that may be, um, but also to, to, to see for ourselves that this is the work that we're doing. It transforms fundamentally, you know, and I feel that we are living in a society that does not appreciate the value of artists in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, thanks for your question. 
Um, okay, Halima, would you like to ask your question? Um, yeah, mine is a little bit more complex. I don't, when I was listening to you, I was thinking of this, um, you, the evoking belonging of, of peoples, peoples, of families, of people who are maybe connected to them, their family. But I'm wondering about the use of this for healing those who come from dysfunctional families, people who feel lost, alone, and rejected. And the idea of calling in or evoking ancestors can be somewhat painful because they feel their ancestors have rejected them. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just wanted to have some reflection about that kind of healing. Uh, just for clarity, thanks for that, Mahalima. Um, you want clarity on the... Well, how, how you might use your poetry right. and your art right. to help individuals connect to themselves. So if they can't connect to their own personal family or personal ancestors, that they can connect to a larger whole and therefore mm -hmm. feel that they belong. Mm, put, mm, put it like that maybe mm, yes thank you for that indeed this is one expression of my work the poetry and this is me as artivist um, sharing uh, these offerings with you the other another aspect to my work is social sculpture and this is where we really look at the relationship between the imagination and transformation and what I do in spaces that I create, I have an evoking belonging sanctuary, for example, where recently we've been having difficult conversations with all of the uprisings that have been happening to really advocate for racial justice following the murder of um, our dear brother George Floyd in the States. The uprisings that we've been seeing globally have evoked this need to have very difficult, painful conversations. And what we find is that in the sanctuary space where I work with contemplative practice, um, a technique that I call imaginative voyaging, we use the imagination to, in a meditative way, really voyage within and take ourselves back to revisit our narratives. You will have heard me speak about narratives and our story in a couple of the poems that I recited this evening. Revisiting our origin story um, in this practice is a way of looking again. It's an excavation, it's an exploration, but it also, when we are able to look at the lenses that we use, look at what we felt was particularly, I mean, evidently this is a process, but look at what we felt was a, a very difficult relationship, for example, in a different way. I'm not a psychologist, but what we do is we work with the sensorial experience to access what we deeply and truly know and to bring those invisible materials into a realm through image making. It's very difficult, I think, to explain. I think it's something you need to really experience, but that's one way in which I use um, this evoking belonging approach to explore uh, questions of disconnection, of displacement, and the really fragile being that sits in the fragile states, you know, that the World Bank speaks about, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions that people would like to ask? Diane is here. Questions, comments? <laughs> Can you see the chat that's coming in, Diane? Have you had time to have it all? Some great comments. Have you seen Lovely. them? Lovely. I can, I'm seeing a few of them, but I'm much more focused here for a moment. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, yeah. Diane, can we, uh, can we respond can from you? suffering? Uh, yes, please do. do. I think um, we'd really like to, well, I'd like to really express my deep gratitude to you, Diane. Uh, for all the work you've done to um, allow this kind of words and imagery through you and into our into our lives tonight um, for me this time is a is a time of the deepest inquiry in what it means to be alive 
um, today. And I um, am blessed to be in a collaboration with a, another woman who's also deeply inquiring. Um, so your words have been very nourishing, very inspiring, challenging. And I think um, I'm particularly grateful for you to um, ask me to connect with my ancestors, ask me to join you in some of the questions you have to ask. And I don't get asked these questions. So I, I really appreciate you sharing the kinds of questions you're asked. And I, I, I really dedicate myself to, to, to trying to ask those questions of myself mm. and not to take them as given and not take them as simple questions. So deep is gratitude to you and to the community for making this space tonight, which is very, has reached very far into our space here. And I'd like to now just ask you, Mish, to share if you feel like it. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, I, 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 woo! Um, I'm a white African um, from Zimbabwe. And so it's, um, uh, it's a wonderful experience to hear a black African sister sharing um, such evocative and profound and also sometimes quite incomprehensible, which I love, but not, <laughs> let's say, curious. Mm. There's curiosity in some of the words that come through and nothing's necessarily completely fixed or cast. And I think you, you, you're creating a, a beautiful map for us. I love what you said, imaginative voyaging. And I think that your words allow us to go into very many expanses of um, ways of being, which are not about this is what this poem is about. And I think I, I, it's, it is, it's sensorial and it's, um, it's, it's full of richness and, and it's full of anguish. Yeah. And, and yet your, your way of um, cohering it has such presence and beauty and I feel very moved and I feel very honoured to be in your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that witness. Our friend has just arrived, so we're going to need to leave you, but thank you so much for such a brilliant, thank you. what thank an event. Bye-bye. Thank you so thank you. much. Bye. Thank you very much. I look forward to more from you. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. Are there anyone else who would like to comment or talk about their responses? I'm just looking at the comments here. There's Alma here making a comment. Alma, would you like to say anything? To unmute Alma. Can you mute? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I joined late, but at a point where Diane was talking um, about her roots and background, and um, I, you know, I connect with that because I am all like displaced. My mother's family um were part of stalin's purge and were thrown out of um they were kind of like middle class they had land and they were doing quite well in near minsk um in Belarusia. so they were sent to siberia and um, my father his family um was broken up by the arrival of the Germans um, at the Second World War. And um, so they met um, in England, in, in, in Shropshire. So I, I, and I was born in Shropshire. Um, and then um, for, my, for my father's work, we moved to Manchester. So I grew up in Manchester and I now live in West Oxfordshire. Uh, we'd love to live in Oxford, 
because it's very expensive. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a city, I'm city bred. I grew up in Manchester, um, but I live in West Oxfordshire. Um, so um, Diane has given me um, food for thought, very much so. Yeah, I, I have been thinking for yonks um, of going to the British Library to investigate my roots. But just about the round the time I was ready, then at the beginning of the year and then the pandemic. So um, that, and that's on hold again. Um, maybe, yeah, so um, I don't know, Diane, uh, it's say more or or I guess I could buy her book <laughs> um, uh, just about that um, in terms of saying more about um, you know, just evoking the ancestors um, that, that, that really you know that, that I just relate to it quite a lot mm -hmm. um, in terms of spirituality, just very quickly, because it's going to be way over time. Um, I mean, I'm very, I'm, my meditation is Buddhist meditation. That's where I found myself. Um, the religion was very big in my family because my mother, my mother's side was Belarusian Orthodox and my father, Roman Catholic. And he was constantly trying to convert me. And, but um, I kind of rejected because I found, so, so I think because of, because it was so strong in my family, I think I like, I think I, you know, so I have, I like, I feel comfortable um, with the tag of Buddhist, I, I feel comfortable in the Buddhist philosophy um, right. environment. Um, yeah, um, so that is my meditation, you know, um, yeah, so, um, and um, it's, 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 every, I've only been home since 7.15, so <laughs> everything's a bit whoosh. <laughs> um, and if I look back and think, of, I just think it's amazing that you come on and there's something that, you know, is kind of, I guess, you know, I think about the past a lot because with my name, Tumilovic, was a constant reminder that my roots aren't here. Mm. You know, you know, um, you know. I'm now sixty, <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, you, you know, and so it's constant. You know, it's constant. Oh, that's an unusual surname. Where's it from? I, I kept my maiden name. I'm married, um, but I kept my husband's been married before, so I kept my maiden name. Um, and I don't know if I would have, even if he wasn't married, I don't know if I would have given me out, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, I'm, it's quite amazing with you saying that, you know, it's just, it's, you know, a bit mind-blowing. <laughs> thank, thank you, Alma. Thank you for that response. I think it, it, it's all touched us in so many ways. Do you want to just quickly, um, Diane, I mean, maybe you can tell Alma a little bit more about Evoking Belonging and the Evoking evoke community, so how she can follow you more, as well as, buying, as well as buying a book, of course. Well, of course, we'd invite everyone to buy the book. That would be fabulous. <laughs> the points you raised, Alma, thank you so much. Um, you've touched on so many aspects of very complex questions. And, you know, as I was preparing to come to you today, I was reflecting on the complexity of these issues. As um, the, oh, they have left now, the two, the Zimbabwean woman just mentioned, I can't remember her name, forgive me. Um, mentioned you know there's a lot of anguish in this poetry as well in the energy because it is often incoherent so much of our history as africans in the diaspora 
has been intentionally erased. At school, you know, even today, my children are not taught about African civilizations. Perhaps our history begins with slavery, which is just not right. It's not true. You know, we hail from ancient civilizations. If they say Africa is the cradle of humankind, there is a lot of work to be done in terms of decolonizing the curriculum, and, you know, just balancing how we present our stories. So Alma, when you speak, I hear about the need for a, a, a narrative which enables you to, fight, to feel some kind of grounding. And for me, the ancestors, and calling the ancestors is one way in which I do that. I do it as a ritual because I understand the power of the spirituality that is encoded within me. I dream of living in the world, no matter where I roam, where when we come, we take water or we take spirits, alcohol, and we, pay, we pour libation when we come for ceremony. This is something that is not so far removed. So my very good girlfriend that I grew up in with in Zambia, who is Nigerian, when we celebrated her 50th birthday a couple of years ago, her father, may he rest in peace, he just passed away not recently, just recently. He said, before anything starts, we have to pour libation. And unfortunately, I can't do this in English. I have to speak my language, Igbo, because the ancestors understand that when I speak in that language, you know. So I'm just sharing that story with you to say there are, this is a, this is living heritage. This is living memory. And part of my, my impulse is to find ways to ignite this within our children. Because what happens is when I see, um, I've looked at migrants, experiences for many years just in people i've observed you know i'll go to i'll be in peckham in london on a sunday and i'll see all the mamas dressed in their attires coming out and it's freezing cold and with this kind of attire like i'm wearing now it's not designed for cold weather <laughs> and you know you're there with some kind of wrap you know it also doesn't it's not easy to to cover yourself because actually you're made to be in a hot country I look at this and I see that as we move, be it for economic reasons, be it to be with the family, you know, there are so many fragments of our being as Africans in the diaspora. And I could just see over the years, I've been observing this since I've known myself as a child and I've always been highly disturbed that this erosion seems to be invisible somehow, even to us. And for me, it was really important that, you know, I begin to claim that space for myself in a world that says that I am an, 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 an other. And this is what the concept of the urban indigen is about, because I'm really saying who is an indigen, who really belongs? How do we create that sense of belonging? It's got to be more than a sense of belonging, you know? I think it has to, I am actually proposing in my work that Belonging is a co-created cultural practice. We all have to be actively engaged in the nurturing of connections with each other. And in your story, Alma, I have found parts of myself in your story. Yes? And so when we're able to create spaces where we can share these stories in a way that families even do not typically do. We are able then to find spaces for, the, for ourselves in the other and for the other in ourselves. And I believe in that way we are weaving a web that holds us together as humanity. And that really is part of the, the the potency, I believe, of Ubuntu. And that's why I work with Ubuntu as a philosophy, to evoke that into the space. And, um, you know, the ancestry for me is a spiritual practice. It's, it's a ritual practice. And it's a ritual practice that I've 
very consciously honed within my work and that I evoke wherever I roam and whenever I share my work. And what I found so interestingly is the more that I do this, no matter who I'm sharing my practice with, the more something is evoked within the space amongst the people I'm sharing with. And I sense deep yearning to, to pick up the threads or to, to pull through that knowing into a contemporary expression. And, you know, for me, as an artist, I just decided many years ago, um, Khalil Gibran is one of my favorite uh, philosophers and he speaks about love being... Sorry, who? Khalil Gibran. Oh, love, love, love. It's about love, love. work being love made visible. And for me, this really is about that. I would not call it labor. It's, it's, it's love made visible, really. And, you know, if it can be, and I feel it has to be expressed for myself and my people in a bid to create a remembering of who we be. Because a lot of my work also, and this is perhaps why I think it's very interesting to have this conversation with within the Green Party, I'm really thinking ahead to think about this idea of participatory governance. There's so much work that has been done in terms of development, which is the, the sphere that I've always worked in, to create spaces where we can engage communities, those that are less seen, less heard, less visible, easily ignored. But how do I come as that member of a marginalized community, marginalized from the centers of power, the structures which systematically oppress us, how do I come to that table that has been, let's give it the benefit of the doubt, created with all good intention to find spaces of connection, to find ways in which we can bring you to the table. If I have not done the work to remember myself, then I believe, and I am proposing, that it's not really possible for us to engage in any kind of equitable conversation or process of governance. It's not possible. With the Green Party, that's why we would like proportional representation on the on the political sort of front so that um like so that my vote counts <laughs> which i would love you know um sadly the vote as we don't know, you know, you know some of it i can't remember when it was it lost the vote yeah so um i suppose it is the same thing but just in a different yeah um, yeah that, that's what you're saying so yeah yeah. Thank um, you. So I need to do some work on myself. <laughs> Call me. We'll do it together. Evoking belonging. We create the sanctuary. No problem. Oh. I'm available for that work with whichever group you work with, whichever organization, whichever company. This is a time, you know, as was also mentioned earlier, for these kinds of difficult conversations to happen. And I feel to be able to create a space which enables also healing justice. Because one thing we're recognizing, dismantling white supremacy also means that those who are allies, and I see many in this room, and I feel many in this room today, also have to go through a process of healing. So that anguish, you know, can only be recognized if, I believe, if that person also is also seeing it and feeling it for themselves. That's why it's resonating. So this is the work I'm doing, and um, it's, it's really wonderful to be able to share it in, in so many ways. So I'm very grateful to have been invited this evening to Thank you so work. much. We, we so appreciate your time. It's, it's been a really, really memorable, fascinating evening. Um, and as someone said, you know, we could listen to you for longer, um, but we, we do need to, to, uh, to call it a day for this evening. But hopefully see you um, in, in meetings and discussions in the future, because I know you are an active member of Abingdon Green Party um, mm -hmm. and, you know, you are politically engaged. Um, so if, if we are allies together, um, then we can all learn together, I think, and we all help each other along the way. It's fantastic. Okay, um, I definitely recommend the book um, because 
um, what you don't get um, is the visuals. The visuals are beautiful um, within it, um, and, and it just works as a piece with this sort of tripartite structure, and then there's the emblem throughout and the photography throughout. Um, and we'll return to it again and again, Halima and I, I think, and, um, you know, it's great. And then um, your on facebook aren't you diane um yes. you're on you've got the evoke evoking belonging community um oxfordshire green party we're online we've got a website we have um a next book club is in august but we're watching a film in august i think it's going to be on friday 7th of august we've chosen to watch 2040 which is a positive look to the future i think we need some uplifting positive stuff to look forward to in the future when we're over this hopeful hopefully it's just a blip um, and we will build back better um, so we're looking forward to that and we, we're going to have a discussion online in the same sort of format about that film um, yeah okay thank you all for your time this evening um, couldn't do it without an audience <laughs> thank you all thank take you. care Thank you so Look much. Look after each other. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you.